Good morning, everyone. I, excuse me a moment, I'll get settled here. Oh, what a pleasure it is to be back with you. It's, uh, we feel like Harry Westside on our hearts. And uh, yeah, it's good to be back with you and uh, have an opportunity to share with you again this morning. You know, I look around this room and uh, some of you have been following Jesus for more than a couple of weeks. And so you've had a bit of experience with him. And uh, I just ask you, um, have you noticed that the, the Lord's not averse to shaking up your life. You know, it's like that I and J commercial, you know, where the guys are going to, you know. You know those times when it seems like that uh, the Lord throws you in the washing machine, you know, hits the spin cycle, then throws you in the dryer and, and tumble dryer and just cranks it up to high heat and just making your life feel like that. If you know what that's like, you also know that, too, though, that the Lord, that when the Lord allows such times, He isn't toying with you, and He's not trying to just mess with your head. Instead, He's doing a deep work of preparation in you, preparation that increases your hunger as well as your trust. Well, I mention all this because that leads me into our text today and, uh, and the people that were involved in our text today. You know, what they had been through through the past 50 days would, could easily have had them wondering which way was up. Here we are at, at the, uh, on Pentecost Sunday. These previous 50 days had been unbelievable for them. They'd started with the celebration of Palm Sunday. Then there was the agony of Jesus' death on the cross. And there was a joyous wonder of resurrection. And now they just had the experience of Jesus leaving again as he ascended back to the Father. What they've been through. He's here. He's gone. He's back. He's gone again. You can imagine just how kind of disorienting that would have been for them. Spin cycle and tumble dry indeed. However, in light of all that they had been through, Jesus did give them one bit of instruction just prior to his ascending back to heaven. And that instruction in one word was, anybody? Wait, wait, wait. Jesus did not say to them, okay, you guys have kind of been with me for a while. You've seen what I've done. You, you see how I've lived. Now I want you to go back to Jerusalem. I want you to form a committee. I want you to begin to do some SWOT analysis. I, I want, want you to be able to do some brainstorming. I want you to put together a budget. And then I want you to figure out how you're going to do this life for the future, okay? That's not what he said. He said, wait. Wait. Wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. John baptized you with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Well, all that's a prelude to our text. Okay, it's me. So you know when we do Scripture, you got to stand. Let's stand together as you read God's Word. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 6. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like a, like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and come to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. 
Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. I've heard it said that history does not repeat itself, but it often rhymes. And that being so, I believe that on this Pentecost Sunday, and in this period of change and transition and uncertainty, that there are some takeaways here for Westside, arising from what we've just read in Acts chapter 2. And I'll offer them a couple of them for you. To me, the first important takeaway is this, and that is the importance of waiting. Of waiting. You do know that waiting is a key component of spiritual life and growth. There are over 100 references in Scripture about waiting on the Lord. Does that rub against the grain for anybody here? It certainly rubs against the grain of our culture, you know, our our frenetic, get her done, hurry up culture. We do not like waiting. I get reminded of this every time I go to see Dr. Sue. Some of you know Dr. Sue. You know, here I am in sitting where in what we used to be called the waiting room, you know, and I'm waiting and I'm waiting. And I find that every minute that ticks past my appointment time, I'm mumbling and grumbling even more. I do not like to wait. And Dr. Sue's are very good at making me wait, but that, that's another story. Beloved, if waiting for the doctor is taxing enough, how about waiting for the Lord for whom a thousand years are but a day? One of the reasons we, I think we don't like waiting is because we've kind of bought into that subtle lie that waiting is really just kind of wasting good time. Because nothing's getting done. So waiting's... Hmm. But as we look at the Scripture, and particularly the experience of these people uh, in Acts chapter 2, their waiting was not passive. As a matter of fact, their waiting involved two, I think, really important aspects. First of all, they waited together. Together. First one said they were all together in one place. And that was merely a continuation of something we read in chapter 1, verse 14. It said, They all join together constantly. You know, beloved, in this time of transition and uncertainty, uncertainty, you know you do need to hang together. Now, I can almost imagine somebody reading this text and thinking, well, sure. It would have been easier for them to be able to do that. They don't have all the, uh, the differences and all the... Uh, you know, all this, the unique things that are part of a, of a modern congregation. Oh, really? You know, because from my reading of Acts, they had a number of differences to overcome themselves. They had some poor, as well as some rich, like Barnabas. They had some religious conservatives from Jerusalem and some so-called liberals from Galilee. They had blue-collar workers and urban elites. Well, they had their differences too. But they had one overarching reality that held them together, and that was their common faith in Jesus. Jesus, their risen Lord, was the glue that minimized their differences and held them together as one body. 
And my friends, I would say to you today, regardless of whatever differences are in this room today, regardless of the differences of opinion, regardless of the difference of approaches, regardless of the difference of taste, right now as you wait, you need to fix your eyes on him who brought you together in this place. The biblical witness is this. In unity, God commands a blessing. Because again, faith is a package deal. You not only get Jesus, but you get a community, His body, who shares your love of Him. They waited together. And I encourage you to do likewise. That was the first part of their waiting. Here's the second. As they waited, they prayed. They prayed. When Charman rang me and asked me to come and speak today, he was saying that that is one of the things that you're doing right now, that you're, you're praying. And beloved, I commend you for that. Praying is the primary work of waiting. The primary thing that you can do right now as you wait and seek God's future is pray. Pressing in. Pouring out your heart. Seeking God's mind. Listening to what the Holy Spirit is saying. Beth Moore talks about this, and, I, and she has a quote that I appreciate. She wrote, There are parts of our calling, works of the Holy Spirit, and the defeats of darkness that will come no other way than through furious, fervent, faith-filled, unceasing prayer. So, beloved, I'd say to you again, as you wait, pray. Pray, pray. Let's move on. Well, there's a second takeaway, I think, from uh, this Pentecost Sunday, and perhaps it's the most obvious one. And that is the importance of the Spirit's empowering. Jesus told them to wait for the gift that the Father promised. And further, he said, when that gift comes, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit does come on you, and you will be my witnesses. So, they prayerfully waited, and on that Pentecost morning, Jesus kept his promise. The Holy Spirit descended on all those believers, manifesting himself as tongues of fire falling on them. Now, to me, it's interesting because I think sometimes we can miss the profound significance of this event. Most of you know this, but it's good to remind ourselves that, you know, previously to this, in the Old Testament, generally speaking, the Holy Spirit was limited to coming upon individuals for specific tasks and often for a specific and limited period of time. But now, Something different is happening. Now, in keeping with the prophecy of Joel, God was giving his spirit to an entire group of people, the church, those who, those who have made Jesus the Lord, and the spirit would now take up permanent residence in this people. And again, further, the Lord had a very specific purpose in mind in doing this in order for this people to be witnesses of who Jesus is. They were empowered for a purpose. Everything that the Holy Spirit did in their lives, everything from signs and wonders to the building of a new community of people who were noted for their love and joy and humility, it was all about fulfilling this purpose of being Jesus' witness. The church has from its start been called by the Lord to live the life of Jesus 
in the midst of a perverse and crooked generation. It was true for them, and it's true for us. The church is called to be a people who live by and tell a different story than that of the world. We are called to, live, to tell that alternative story, and that, it, that, it is, that, that alternative story, rather, is that the world has a new king, and that new king is Jesus. And the church is to be a living demonstration of what life looks like when Jesus is in charge. And as we gather here today as believers in Jesus, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, we are compelled by the same calling. The same calling rests upon us. And I don't know about you, but uh, to try to, who among us here has the imagination or the creativity or even the vision to take the witness of Jesus to the whole world? That's something that requires so much of us. That's why, my friends, it's only doable by the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. You know, not to put anybody down here, but if Westside was just a collection of ordinary people trying your best with your collective abilities and resources to fulfill Jesus' calling, honestly, I wouldn't like your chances. But hear the good news. Hear the good news. Because the Spirit of God is indwelling this place, because the empowering Spirit of God and dwells his church and his people. There are no ordinary people. And as a result, there are no ordinary churches. You have been transformed. As a believer, you are now empowered by the Spirit to live a life that provides a sneak peek of heaven to come. You are. You are a preview of coming attractions. Do you believe that? Because that's your legacy. That's your legacy. Now again, perhaps you're sitting here and you think, well, Jim, that sounds pretty good. That and that empowering stuff, you know, and that sort of, but uh, that isn't my experience. Well, I appreciate you. A lot of you are using Lectio 365. You might have read that in this week because it kind of addressed this sort of this sort of issue. We read in that Lectio 365 this comment: "It's easy to define my expectation by my spiritual experience to this point, rather than by the promises of Jesus and the biblical witness of Scripture." But what if the gap between biblical promises and my personal experience? is a gap God longs to close. What if that's true? What if that's true? What if God's word to West Side today is, remember who you are. Remember whose you are. Remember, you're not an ordinary person anymore. You are a transformed, spirit-filled individual who's part of a great community of God who has been set forth on this planet for a special purpose. Remember who you are, regardless of how vulnerable or uncertain or even unclear you feel that your future is. Remember who you are. You're not some poor, bereft collection of humanity. You're not just some sort of ordinary church just trying to get by. You are the people of the living God. You are living the life of your Lord Jesus. And you are empowered to do so by the same spirit of power that raised Jesus from the dead. He dwells in you as a believer in Christ. Beloved, whatever lies ahead for this uh, fellowship, remember who you are and live out of that reality. 
Let this be a time of living boldly your life in Christ. By word and deed, tell a better and more compelling story through your life. By the Spirit's power, be the light of the world. Be that city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. And I'd say to you too, discern the time. Discern the time. I, I don't know if you, you know, I know some of you have been praying for renewal. Some of you have been praying that, that God would send a time of revival. And sometimes it feels like those prayers have just kind of hit the ceiling and bounced back. But you know, as you look, as you listen to what's happening around the world, the first seeds of change, I believe, are happening. I read a story just the other just the other day how that in France, secular France, churches there experienced over twelve thousand baptisms during the Easter weekend. Westminster Cathedral in London. Secular London, everybody tells us, is going Muslim. Had so many people show up for Good Friday services, they had to close the doors. And you think, well, Jim, that's, that's there, that's elsewhere. I just read, just read this week, a high school on the, on the Gold Coast. Hundreds of kids made first-time decisions for Christ. It's not just over there, it's here. You see the seedlings of the things that we've longed for and prayed for? This is not a time to be timid. This is not a time to sit back. This is a time for bold witness. However God does that through your life. Beloved, I want to encourage you, now is the season of boldness. With spirit renewed faith, offer words along with signs and wonders, and let the glory of Jesus be expressed through you. This is your calling. Do these things, and then leave the results and the details to your Heavenly Father. I'll finish with this. Those in Jerusalem woke up that first Pentecostal morning, the first Pentecost morning, one kind of people. They went to bed that night, a different kind of people. They would never again be as small or as insignificant as they were at the start of that day. Never again. The empowering presence of the Holy Spirit changed them and their history. And I'm just silly enough to have the belief that the Holy Spirit loves doing that in every generation. Renewing, empowering, and sending the body of Christ forward into God's good purpose in Christ. Here's something to ponder. What if sometime in the coming days you look back and say, you know, it, it was a time of, well, we just weren't sure where, what was going to happen next. Time of uncertainty. We weren't feeling all that strong. But you know what? Pentecost 2024 was kind of a low watermark for West Side. But we waited on the Lord. We sought His empowering. And God heard our longing and sent His Spirit and changed our history. Just like He did at Pentecost. Do you have even a mustard seed of faith to believe something like that could be true here? And I just say to you with the Apostle Paul, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man 
the things which God has prepared for those who love Him. I can't finish this without praying for you, all right? I thought it's interesting that the Lord brought me here on Pentecost. <laughs> so I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. Let's bow together. Father, we bless you that in your wisdom and your mercy, you sent the Lord Jesus into our lives. Lord Jesus, we bless you that in obedience to the Father, you allowed yourself to be sent for us and for our salvation. And we bless you, Lord Jesus, that your promise was you would not leave us as orphans, but that you would send your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we thank you that you have kept that promise and sent your spirit to dwell in your church. But Lord, we, we say today that we need a fresh infilling of your spirit. Lord, I pray for your people here at Westside. I say, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit and fill your people afresh. Renew their fervor. Renew their zeal for you and your kingdom. Let them be filled with a, a, a God-filled imagination that will lead them into the future. Let them be empowered afresh to give vital, winsome witness to who you are, Jesus. And Lord, may you empower them afresh to live your unique, compelling life in this generation. Come, Holy Spirit, and fill your people afresh, I pray. May Westside have a fresh experience of Pentecost themselves. In Jesus' name.